In today's lecture, we will uh, simulate the uh, generator with uh, an AVR. Uh, in the last class, we had of course, discussed various transfer functions, uh, which could be used uh, with an AVR. We now integrate the system. In fact, this is our uh, kind of first uh, uh, experience of uh, trying to simulate a control system, the power apparatus and the external power system. Okay. So, uh, that is what we will do today. Uh, recall that in the previous class, uh, you can look at this uh, paper. We had discussed the model of a simple static excitation system. We have chosen a static excitation system, because it is the model of the excitation power apparatus is very simple. The only complexity, so to speak, is uh, the limits of the static exciter, uh, which are dependent on the terminal voltage. Remember that if we normalize the field voltage and the control voltage to their corresponding values, when we get uh, 1 per unit at the terminal of an open circuited generator running at rated speed, then the gain of this converter can be uh, is effectively 1, because everything is normalized. The control signal also is normalized and the output also is normalized. If we have V ref minus V, the summing junction, okay, V and V, uh, V ref and V are expressed in per unit, then a typical or uh, rather a transfer function, which we can use the simplest one, one can say is a proportional type static excitation system. T a is very small. The gain k a, uh, when we use the normalized control output and also the per unit values of voltage uh, here, in that case k a is typically around 200, 300 or you know that it is in that range. Okay. So, coming back to uh, what we will be doing this lecture is to actually mathematically write down these equations. I will just show you a simple simulation and we shall also try to study the behavior of a synchronous machine connected to a infinite bus or a voltage source through a reactance and uh, with the AVR regulating the terminal voltage of the generator. So far, we have been considering constant field voltage or uh, the field voltage you can say manually increased in steps, but now we will have an automatic continuously acting feedback uh, control system. So, today's lecture will be focused on uh, the simulation of a generator connected uh, to an infinite voltage source with the AVR in action. Okay. So, uh, this is of course, the starting point of our uh, discussion yesterday. The only thing we will be simulating today, at least in the beginning would be the regulator function. We will not of course, be talking about the limiter and protective circuits or the power system stabilizer, although I hope to give you a motivation for its use uh, today itself, why we need a stabilizer. Uh, as I mentioned some time back, we will be using a simple model of an excitation system that is a static exciter and a generator which is connected to a power system. Okay. And uh, of course, as I mentioned a couple of lectures back, uh, we will be simply trying to regulate the voltage that is the terminal voltage is measured and compared with the reference. Uh, we will not be putting any compensation for the load on the generator. So, we will not be having uh, in the summing block any component corresponding to the current output of the generator. Okay. So, simply we will be having V ref minus V at the summing junction of the AVR. So, this is our static excitation system and as I mentioned some time back, so this is the model we will be using for the system. Now, when we want to simulate a synchronous generator connected to uh, an infinite bus, we will again have to use the equations which are given here. The fluxes of course, are something we have defined earlier, these are the fluxes of the synchronous machine. I d and I q are the currents going out of the machine. V d and V q are of course, the voltages at the terminal of the machine and E f d is the per unit value of the field voltage as defined earlier. Now, remember that currents and uh, fluxes are related by an algebraic relationship as given here and A 1 is of this form. Remember, show, uh, you, you can notice the omega dependence of A 1, okay. that is an important thing you should remember. And A 2 of course, uh, which relates the uh, the derivative of the flux to the current is given by this, B 1 and B 2 are given by these, okay, by these matrices. And A 3, which relates 
the current to the fluxes is a matrix. Uh, it is a 2 into 6 matrix. Okay. Now, of course, uh, we are not considering 0 sequence. The implicit thing in all our discussion so far have been uh, that we are having a balanced system. So, we do not actually have to model the 0 sequence. The thing is that the 0 sequence variables do not appear in uh, the d q variable equations. So, there is a complete decoupling that coupling will occur in case you the synchronous machine is connected to an unbalanced network, okay. but otherwise these equations are completely decoupled and the 0 sequence uh, equations can be separated out. 0 sequence equations have no source of excitation uh, in case uh, you, you have got a balanced system. So, you can practically say that all the 0 sequence variables are 0 and they are not coupled with the uh, d q variables. So, that is the reason why we are not considering 0 sequence variables, but in case you do study unbalanced systems, you should remember uh, to take into account the 0 sequence equations. Okay. Now, coming to the system we are going to study. Now, uh, in the last simulation which I had shown you, I had got a synchronous machine which is synchronized directly to a voltage source. Okay and that was the kind of simplest system I could have shown you uh, this synchronization. In order to show AVR action of course, it does not make sense to connect a, a synchronizer generator to a voltage source, because if you have connected a generator to a voltage source which is a stiff or, or constant voltage source, there is no question of voltage regulation, because the voltage is maintained by the voltage it source itself. Okay. So, voltage regulation makes no sense in case you have got a generator directly connected to a voltage source in this fashion. Of course, this is a symbolic representation of the generator. The generator itself uh, is not a voltage source, it is uh, represented by the equations which I have already shown you. Now, the aim of the AVR is trying to maintain the voltage of this constant. Okay. So, constant or near constant. In fact, uh, if you are using a proportional gain, it is near constant, not uh, perfectly constant. Okay. Now, as I said, this does not make any sense if you have got a perfect voltage source here uh, to which this generator is connected. What makes sense of course, to uh, you know show the action of a AVR is to connect it to a infinite bus or a large grid. Okay. It is connected to a large grid, it is also called an infinite bus or a constant voltage source whose magnitude, frequency phase angle all are all remain constant. Okay. What we are going to do is connect it via a, what would you connect it via? A transmission line or a transformer, a transformer and a transmission line. Okay. So, this is a transmission line. Now, uh, we have not gone into the modeling of a transmission line. So, we will not really uh, delve deeply into this uh, modeling of the transmission line itself, but you will know that uh, well a kind of a simple model of a generator connected via a transmission line and a transformer a very simple model could be a lumped reactor okay this is the simplest model let's uh, you know which one can have you know in a uh, in a laboratory you could actually make this setup you could actually connect it via a reactor okay but right now we'll assume that you've got a three phase inductance l which connects the generator to the the perfect voltage source that is the infinite bus. Now, the generator now can um, you know um, maintain the terminal voltage uh, try to maintain the terminal voltage because it tends to vary. How does it vary the uh, how does the terminal voltage vary? For example, if the power output of this generator changes okay, in that case the current through this will change and you will find that the voltage here changes. Now, the only way you can maintain this voltage here uh, at a near constant value is to have a closed loop, loop feedback system which changes EFD the field voltage. Okay. Now, in of course, in steady state uh, you, uh, the steady state representation of a non salient pole generator is simply like this. Please refer to a fairly early analysis of a steady state steady state analysis of a synchronous generator which was done roughly 6 or 7 lectures back quite time quite at some time back. So, a steady state representation of a non salient pole synchronous generator is this. Okay. 
So, this is the steady state rep not of course, please do not use this under transient conditions under transient conditions you will actually have to use uh, the differential equation model of the synchronous machine. So, do not use this for a transient representation of a machine, but we can see that uh, if you have got a system like this infinite bus at least in steady state it is easy to see that if I change E f d uh, I will be able to control or change the voltage here. Okay. So, this is the basic principle of course, of the AVR itself that you change E f d. Okay. Now, coming to the model of this transmission line, now this is a simple uh, you know uh, reactor whose inductance is L, then uh, the equations are given as shown in this slide that is uh, L d i a by d t is equal to V a minus E a. E a is of course, uh, E a and V a are in fact, the phase to neutral voltages of uh, the balanced uh, infinite uh, the generator as well as the infinite bus. Okay. So, uh, remember that E a, E b, E c actually represent the phase to no neutral voltages of uh, the infinite bus and the synchronous generator. For simplicity, we will of course, assume uh, that your infinite bus is simply E a is nothing but. So, for simplicity, we will assume E a so the phase to neutral voltage of the infinite bus is nothing but root 2 by 3 v line to line r m s so the line to line r m s of uh, rather I should call it E. Yeah, uh, That would be notationally more easy to remember. This is E sin omega 0 t. Okay. So, we will assume that your sing, uh, the infinite bus is of course, this. this is 120 degrees this plus 120 degrees. Now, so omega naught is the constant frequency of the infinite bus. Okay. So, this is what E a means. Now, uh, if you look at uh, what will happen in case you try to transform this into d q 0 variables. Now, transforming uh, d q 0 variables is quite simple in this case, you know the d q transformation, we have talked about the d q transformation or the Parkes transformation. Okay. So, if you use the Parkes transformation, uh, you transform i a, i b, i c into i d, i q and i 0. And uh, by doing that, uh, the equations are quite straightforward, but remember that uh, you get these uh, speed terms you know or rather I should say uh, omega dependence. Omega remember is d theta by d t where theta is the position instantaneous position of the rotor of the machine. So, if you do the d q analysis of this uh, system you can express this equation in this fashion uh, it is also in per unit. Okay. So, what you see as x here is omega b l by z base. Okay. So, you the best thing would be of course, to use a common base which is the base of the synchronous machine itself. Okay. So, the impedance base of the synchronous machine is used, we have defined the basis some time ago in our course. Now, uh, one small uh, and interesting point which we have here is uh, the current through the this reactor which is interconnecting the synchronous machine to the infinite bus is the same as the current through the synchronous machine. So, actually if you look at the synchronous machine, this is your synchronous machine, this is, uh, this is not this is only a symbolic representation, this is not a electrical circuit. Remember a synchronous generator cannot be represented simply as a voltage source. This is your reactor and this is here. So, your current output of the machine I d I q is the same as the current through this I d and I q. Okay. I 0 also is there, uh, which uh, the neglection of which uh, the, the neglect of which uh, I have already explained some time back. Of course, if you have got some load here, for example, if you have got a res, you know a resistive load here or any kind of load here, this will not be true. Okay. So, if I have got something here, then I d and I q are not the same for the generator and the inductor. Okay. Now, one of the interesting points which you have here is uh, this is an interesting theoretically also is uh, and also has practical consequences when you are trying to program uh, the simulation of uh, this system is that 
since i d and i q are effectively determined are a function of the fluxes. Okay? They are algebraically related to the fluxes, we have seen that, but you also see that i d and i q are also determined by this differential equation. Okay? So, obviously, there is a kind of a interesting situation here, you have got two sets of one algebraic equation and one differential equation which are which both are trying to define the current. Okay? So, this is a actually a you have to be consistent. Okay? You cannot have this differential equation for example, telling you that the current is something else and the algebraic equation is telling you something else. Remember the algebraic equations relate the current to the flux which are fluxes which are again independently determined by differential equations. So, this so the issue here is that in some sense we have got uh, these two differential equations here they are quite redundant in the sense that i d i q is already determined by that uh, by an algebraic relationship with the fluxes. So, you really do not need to define two uh, uh, you know this extra set of differential equations okay? uh, and uh, if we do use these differential equations as well we have to be really care to be consistent in the sense you cannot give i d and i q here for example, the initial conditions for these differential equations which are inconsistent with what you would obtain when uh, uh, you get the currents uh, uh, algebraically related to the fluxes. Okay? So, all the initial conditions would need to be absolutely consistent. Okay? Now, uh, the, a situation like this could arise, this is of course, slight diversion from our main theme of power system dynamics, but uh, it would be nice to just uh, chew on this. Suppose, I have got two capacitors uh, which are in parallel. Okay? So, you can have this is suppose the current here is I. So, I have got d v by d c c 1 c 2 is equal to i 1 i 2. So, we will call this v 1 and v 2 the voltage is v 1 v 2. So, we will have c 1 d 1 v 2 by d 1 by d t is equal to i 1 and c 2 d v 2 by d t is equal to i 2 and i 1 plus i 2 is equal to i and v 1 should be equal to v 2. So, actually this in some sense you can say that uh, you know by choosing v 1 equal to v 2 why do we require a differential equation again why do we need another law to define v 2. Okay? So, this in some sense v 2 is again a redundant state in such a situation. Okay? So, uh, when you are actually trying to simulate such a system, it is better to uh, remove the redundant states. You know of course, that V 2 is dependent on V 1, it is equal to V uh, V 1 and V 2 are equal. Okay? So, you only need to uh, determine the current through this, whatever voltage you have here will uh, be the same as the voltage here. You can have another situation where an inductor is connected to another inductor. Okay? So, uh, there, there to you know uh, the question is how many states are there you know you you can if you write two differential equations okay uh, this could be even you could take even a one inductance split it into two and get into this problem okay so this is uh, something which uh, this is a similar situation which you encounter here of course this problem is solved in case you have got something connected in shunt which is not an inductor for example a resistor or a capacitor you connect it then these two states become distinct you can have two differential two sets of differential equations which really uh, for these inductors uh, which define uh, give you separate and important information okay so uh, this is one uh, interesting point which uh, you know you should uh, chew upon if you look at uh, something about the infinite bus itself we are kind of progressing to finally getting our equations uh, we have not actually solved this earlier problem of redundant states. I have just told you that they, they, these states are in actually redundant because i d and i q are obtained by algebraic relationships with the state. So, how do you use this information usefully? So, that is something which uh, you need to chew upon. Uh, the infinite bus itself remember its frequency is omega naught okay? and uh, the phase angle since E a, E b and E c are uh, defined to be these. Okay. Now, if the rotor angle position theta, okay, that is the position of the rotor theta is defined like this. Okay. If omega naught is the frequency of the infinite bus, rotor position is omega naught t plus delta, which also means 
which also means that if you have got a say a two pole machine, we will just talk about a two pole machine here. Uh, the A phase winding, the axis of the A phase winding and the axis of the rotor winding, the field winding that is, is delta whenever there is a negative to positive 0 crossing. Okay. So, if I at every negative to positive 0 crossing of this sine wave, if I take a snapshot of a synchronous machine of the synchronous machine, I will see that the rotor is at an angle delta. So, that is what delta means. Okay. Now, if that is the case, E d will be E sin minus E sin delta, this is something we have defined before, it is just apply, obtained by applying the d q transformation to E a, E b and E c and uh, d delta by d t from by differentiate, differentiating theta, theta d theta by d t is nothing but the speed of the machine, the instantaneous speed of the machine, which uh, which is nothing but omega naught plus d delta by d t and that is how I get d delta by d t is equal to omega minus omega naught. Let us assume that E is equal to 1 and the frequency of the infinite bus is equal to the base frequency. So, this will simplify our, mat, uh, our uh, uh, analysis. So, what we have now is the synchronous machine and plus the equations of the external network. Now, uh, what remains to be done of course, is the exciter equations themselves. Okay. The excitation system essentially takes a feedback of the voltage, the terminal voltage V d and V q and uh, the set point is what is given by us okay. and this is how your system looks like. Now, uh, one of the things is that for the excitation system, we really require to know the magnitude of the voltage okay? and uh, that is something we will spend little bit of time on now. Uh, what is the terminal voltage magnitude? In fact, I have been using this uh, somewhat nebulous kind of concept of a voltage magnitude. Okay? This, this is the voltage magnitude of the terminal. You know, What is V? V is the magnitude of the voltage at the terminals of a synchronous machine, but you will immediately recognize is uh, the fact that voltage magnitude in transient, what do we mean? You know, If you have got a pure sinusoid, uh, then getting the magnitude is very simple. You know, you can uh, for example, take the peak value and uh, you can uh, do a, you know kind of from the peak value, you can find out the line to line RMS value of the voltage. So, if you got balanced three phase sinusoids, you can get the peak value of any phase and then get the line to line RMS magnitude. Okay. Now, magnitude of course, is in some sense a coefficient of the, uh, the sinusoidal term. Uh, when we write down the time relationship, so when I say magnitude, I, I usually mean something like this. If I want the magnitude of a sinusoid, I mean that I usually mean that the coefficient here is the magnitude, okay. but this assumes that you have got a sinusoid. Okay. Now, if I give you a waveform which is like this and I tell you well, find out the magnitude of the sinusoid here in this case, uh, that is a bit of a, uh, a bit of a question mark because this is no longer a sinusoid. So, what do I represent this as and how do I get the magnitude as a coefficient of a sine function, you know, when this is a transient kind of behavior where you cannot represent it as a pure sinusoid. So, this is an interesting point in uh, in practice whenever I am getting the magnitude of V, what could I do? Okay. One of the things I could do is you take the three phase voltages V A, V B, V C. Okay. So, for example, you have got V A is the voltage across the winding of a synchronous machine, I could connect them in star and I could take the phase to neutral voltage which is the voltage across the y winding, give it here, sense it. So, I will get 3 sin, uh, well in, si in steady state I will get 3 sinusoids, but otherwise of course, I will get simply the instantaneous values V A n, V B n and V C n. Now, one of the ways you could uh, you know define magnitude of a voltage is uh, to take the Fourier component of uh, V A. Okay. 
V A N, V B N and V C N. For example, uh, of course, your data is just coming in, you know, it is not a fixed signal, but uh, you know, you are kind of continuously getting, if this is a digital signal system, for example, you will be continuously getting samples of V A N, V B N and V C N. So, how do you actually take out the magnitude uh, or you can say Fourier coefficient of this, uh, fundamental Fourier coefficient of this? Well, so I could define V A bar as something like this T minus T to T ok. So, this is one way of defining it ok. So, you try to get the magnitude of V A in this fashion you know as you get the instantaneous values you evaluate this integral using some kind of function you know you will have to actually implement this using for example, digitally you can implement a, a numerical integrator using the discrete samples of V A n. So, this is what you could do ok uh, and get uh, you know uh, the uh, kind of a Fourier coefficient. Of course, during transients uh, you know you will get something ok which uh, seems reasonable to assume uh, what you will get is the Fourier uh, what you call the magnitude of V A ok. So, this is one way of doing it. In fact, you will have to get a uh, sin component as well as a cosine component and then you know whatever you get you know uh, let us call this the sin component and uh, this is the cosine component this is of course, a real number and then you can use this root of V A S square plus V A C square to get what we can call or define the magnitude ok. So, if you rec, uh, you should remember that when it comes to transients you have to kind of uh, you know define what is voltage magnitude there is no you know you, there is no definition by definition you cannot uh, have a magnitude of uh, rather uh, naturally or inherently there is no meaning to having a magnitude uh, of uh, a non sinusoidal wave ok. So, uh, Another easy way of doing things is uh, you take this V A, V B and V C okay, and uh, you compute root of V A square plus V B square plus V C square. Okay. Now, this also I can uh, you know call as the magnitude of the voltage. Remember that if V A, V B and V C are balanced sinusoids, I leave it to you to prove that V will be a constant and equal to the line to line RMS magnitude ok. So, if V A n, V B n and V C n we take evaluate this you know instant uh, instant by instant ok. So, this is an instantaneous value. If V A, V B, V C are pure sinusoids balanced sinusoids balanced set of sinusoids, you can show that V is a constant and equal to the line to line RMS voltage under these circumstances ok. So, what one extension I can do is that even during transients even during transients treat this V as if it is a voltage magnitude ok. So, this is one way of doing things and this is a simple way of doing things ok. So, you can either use this kind of method of finding the Fourier comp components even during transients by using this kind of numerical integration or you can take the instantaneous values of V A n, V B n, V C n square them and square and add them up get this value of V and treat it as if it is the voltage magnitude even during non sinusoidal and transient conditions ok. Of course, V is not a constant in case the system is not balanced or during transient conditions ok. But eventually V settles down to a constant value if the transient dies down and we reach a balanced sinusoidal steady state ok. So, this is one important point. So, if V is equal to root of V A square plus V B square plus V C square you can show that this is equal to so you can actually uh, actually it is plus V 0 square, but we are of course uh, assuming we are uh, using absolutely balanced system. So, V naught is 0. So, V can be defined as root of V d square plus V q square. In fact, what it means really is that uh, we can use our equations in the d q form and model the summing junction of an A v r 
okay, the inputs of the summing junction of, of the AVR by simple d q variables themselves. Okay. Now, can you prove this? I will leave it to you to prove. Uh, one of the things I can just uh, hint to you is V is equal to V A, V B, V C into V A, V B and V C and of course, the square root of it. So, raise to half and uh, remember that V A, V B, V C into this can be treated as identity into V A, V B, V C. This identity matrix can be written as C P transpose into C, C P the Parks transformation okay? and that is how you will get this particular relationship. You can just work it out. There are some other interesting points at this stage uh, which I must tell you is that what is real power? Okay, real power in terms of um, you know at a bus, you know injected at a bus. Uh, uh, what is the real power in terms of the DQ variables? Now, instantaneous power, okay, is defined as in three phase balance setup. Is this this is instantaneous power? Okay. Now you can show that this is nothing but if you use the transformation which you have used some time back that is the Parks transformation with the appropriate values of KD and KQ, this is in fact equal to this. Okay. Remember of course, that in sinusoidal steady state this product is a constant, the balanced sinusoidal steady state this product is a constant. Reactive power, what is the definition of instantaneous reactive power? Well, now we have to be a bit careful. Uh, reactive power probably makes no sense at least I cannot make much sense out of reactive power uh, defined on an instantaneous basis. But if you for example, uh, you can show that Q, uh, Q T uh, this uh, the reactive power instantly can be defined. So, it can be defined as under balance situations of course, you, you can show that this in fact boils down to our normal definition of reactive power. Okay. So, this is something please uh, think over. If you have got a three phase sinusoidal uh, circuit with a sin uh, you know you can just take a simple star connected circuit and prove these things. That at least in sinusoidal steady state this is true. This matches with sinusoidal balanced steady state, this particular expression matches with our classical expression of Q. Okay. But Q instantaneous reactive power can be defined in such a fashion. Okay. Remember that uh, it does not really make sense to define uh, means uh, reactive power is a kind of a steady state concept. Okay. It is a sinusoidal steady state concept. Uh, so, again it is a bit uh, you know you should re remember that whenever you say instantaneous reactive power is this, this is only a, a mathematical artifice and it is not really have does not have any physical meaning, but in steady state of course, this boils down to what is our classical definition of reactive power which indeed has a physical uh, make some physical sense. Okay. So, please uh, this is something you should um, just think over it is an interesting uh, problem in itself. Okay. Now, if I am measuring V as root of V d square plus V q square, I am getting instantaneous values of magnitude or this is the definition of the instantaneous value of magnitude, which is consistent with what we get in steady state. Okay. So, this will be equal to the line to line RMS voltage magnitude in steady state. Okay. So, this is a nice definition. Okay. Of course, if you are under unbalanced conditions, it is not difficult to show that V d square plus V q square square root of that is not a constant. Okay. So, whenever we are making uh, for example, we could have V ref and we could be calculating uh, the magnitude say by taking V a, V b, V c. Okay. From V a, V b, V c, we may be getting square root of 
v d square plus v q square as the magnitude. Normally, we will not use this without any kind of filtering, we will normally pass it through some low pass filter. Okay. So, this is uh, something which uh, you should remember, but this low pass filter would be basically uh, designed only to reject high frequency transients, not the slow transients. Okay. High frequency noise or unbalance which will cause V d square plus V q square to keep varying will be removed by this low pass filter. Okay. So, this is how a summing junction would look like. Now, uh, Another, in other, another interesting uh, point is that if I do not use this d q definition of voltage magnitude, but instead use the square root of V a square plus V a c square, okay, this is for the a phase square root of as the magnitude and this is how I define and compute uh, this from the instantaneous values. In that case, uh, remember that since we are doing an integration here, this is a moving kind of integration from t minus t. So, it is over a window of t. Okay. Then, uh, in this case, there is a kind of inherent uh, you know uh, filtering effect which is there okay, because of this integration. Okay. So, just think over it. It is an interesting problem uh, of computing uh, instantaneous magnitudes and so on. Okay. So, in this particular uh, course, we shall assume that this is when I say magnitude, it is this root of V d square plus V q square, the square root of it. Okay. So, that is what is uh, what we have. So, if I want to write down the uh, the model of a AVR and exciter, this is what we need to do. Yeah. So, if we take a simple static exciter model, okay, which is suitable uh, for, uh, for slow transients, slow transients I mean uh, typically associated with electromechanical phenomena like swings okay, or uh, you know low frequency transients of around 1 between 1 or 2 hertz okay, which involve oscillations of 1 or 2 hertz. Okay. That is what I will define as a slow transient. In that case, this is a simple uh, model that is the AVR is k 1 plus s T a. Okay. Then you have got this limit and you have got E f t. So, the differential equations which you get are uh, let us call this state associated with this transfer function is x c. We have already seen uh, in the previous class that 1 upon 1 plus s t a can be written down in terms of state equations. Okay. So, in such a case uh, what we have effectively is uh, d x c by d t is equal to minus 1 upon t a into x c plus k a into the input which is nothing but the error v ref minus v and as I have defined some time back the voltage magnitude is root of v d square plus v q c the terminal voltage of the generator. Okay. Now, x c itself is not e f d well not always okay. x c is equal to e f d only if the value of x c lies within the limits. For example, we could have plus as I mentioned in the previous class, we could have plus 7.0 v and minus 7.0 v. This is essentially modeling the limits of the converter in the sense that it is the, the output of the converter will be limited by the AC input to it. Okay. So, x c will be e equal to E f d only if x c is between minus 7 times v and plus 7 times v. Okay. This is not volts, this is the voltage magnitude of the terminal voltage. Okay. So, this is what we get. If we had used a brushless excitation system, remember that we would get uh, much more complicated equations for the excitation system. Okay. So, uh, if I used a brushless exciter, in fact, the output would depend, uh, there would be dynamical equations associated with the excitation power apparatus as well. Okay. So, as I mentioned in the previous class, you need to look at the IEEE standard uh, or several books which really describe a brushless excitation system modeling in detail. But if you are talking about static excitation system, it is practically only the limit which has to be modeled. Okay. The AVR of course, is a simple transfer function, it is simply a proportional controller. In practice, you may have something more complicated, you may have lead lag blocks also in series with it, but uh, we will not really go into uh, modeling that much in detail. Okay. We will just do a simple simulation to uh, show you the effect of the static excitation system. 
If studying slow electromechanical transients while operating near the nominal speed, we can as an approximation set d psi d by d t is equal to 0 and d psi q by d t equal to 0 and omega approximately equals omega base. Okay? So, this is of course, if you are operating near the normal speed and we are interested in the slow transients okay? as we have just discussed in uh, our pre previous uh, treatment of this uh, system. Now, uh, one more, uh, so we have now two algebraic equations here instead of differential equations. Okay? On the other hand, uh, our model of the interconnection, I have mentioned some this sometime back in the context of uh, the presence of redundant states. The model of the interconnection is given by this differential equation. Okay? Now, as a logical extension to the approximation which you have just made that is d psi d by d t is equal to 0 and d psi q by d t is equal to 0 omega approximately equal to omega b. It makes sense to set d i d by d t is equal to 0 and d i q by d t is equal to 0 as well in these equations. Okay? So, if we do that of course, the differential equations get converted to algebraic equations. The differential equation which I just showed in the previous slide gets converted to the algebraic equation which is shown here. Okay? So, of course, uh, what is the logic for doing this? Remember that in case we are neglecting fast transients by setting d psi d by d t is equal to 0 and d psi q by d t is equal to 0, there is really no point in retaining uh, rather uh, describing i d and i q by a differential equation, because if I do retain this differential equation, uh, then we are not really getting rid of a fast transient. You can show this is something which I am not proving here. But you can show that if I retain this differential equation while setting d psi d by d t equal to 0 and d psi q by d t equal to 0, I am not really getting rid of the fast transients. Because of this differential equation, you will still have fast transients and the system will be still stiff. So, in case you are studying slow electromechanical uh, uh, you know, phenomena, it makes sense not only to set d psi d by d t equal to 0 and d psi q by d t equal to 0 but also d i d by d t equal to 0 and d i q by d t equal to 0. As a result, you get these algebraic equations. Okay? So, now we have in fact, if you, if you have noticed, got rid of four differential equations and have algebraic equations in their place. Okay? Now, let us look at the other differential equations of the system. Uh, incidentally, before we go ahead, uh, remember that the redundancy of states, uh, which I was just discussing some time back in this lecture, uh, that problem in some sense gets also solved, because once we set d i d by d t equal to 0 and d i q by d t equal to 0, d psi d by d t and d psi q by d t equal to 0, they are no longer states and then we do not have to give initial conditions to them. And if we do not give initial conditions to them, we do not have, have to worry about giving consistent initial conditions uh, to, to these uh, variables. Okay? Now, in fact, to some extent you will notice that uh, rather I should say that since you have got i d i q psi d psi q as algebraic variables, which are really dependent on other, other uh, variables in the system we do not have to bother about the redundancy in the states problem anymore. Looking at the differential equations, let us just scan through all the equations again. This is the torque equation in per unit. These are the rotor flux equations. Remember that psi d psi q no longer being states, we do not have to write the differential equation for psi d and psi q. Okay. So, the only differential equations uh, as far as the uh, uh, you know flux equations are concerned are the rotor flux equations. Okay. So, let us just, so we have got one differential equation of the rotor speed, four differential equations corresponding to the rotor flux equations. Later on, we shall also see that there is one differential equation corresponding to the rotor angle delta. Okay. 
a 1 dash a 1 double dash and b 2 dash are given by these equations. There is also an algebraic relationship which relates i d and i q to psi d psi q psi f psi h psi g and psi k. So, there are two algebraic equations, there are two algebraic equations which really relate i d and i q to the rotor and stator fluxes. Okay? So, these are algebraic equations not differential equations. Okay? So, overall Incidentally, A 3 is given by this. So, in this equation A 3 is given by this. We also see that E d and E q which appear in these equations. Okay? In fact, E d and E q appears in the algebraic relationship of I d and I q which we discussed uh, some time ago. So, E d is nothing but E sin delta and minus E sin delta and E q is equal to E cos delta. This is by applying Parkes transformation to E a n, E b n and E c n which are the phase to neutral voltages of the infinite bus. Okay? This is one differential equation here. Remember that in this, uh, in this system uh, we assume this data E is equal to 1 and the frequency of the omega uh, of the infinite bus is equal to the nominal frequency or the base frequency. This is of course, data which is given to us or rather I am giving it to you. Uh, this could be uh, this is this for example, E could be 1.1 also or the frequency of the infinite bus could be slightly higher or lower than the nominal speed, but let us for simplicity let us assume E is equal to 1 and omega naught is equal to omega b. Okay? So, we are assuming that the infinite bus frequency is the nominal bus frequency, nominal, uh, nominal frequency for the synchronous machine. The static exciter is modeled by a first order differential equation. Okay? Now, x c is not the same as E f d. In fact, x c is, is the same as E f d only if uh, x c is within the limits of the excitation system. Of course, if it, if it exceeds the limits, uh, then x c is clipped to the maximum or the minimum value of E f d. Okay, as defined by the exciter model. So, actually this is a simple static exciter plus voltage regulator model. Okay. So, in fact, I should write here static exciter plus automatic voltage regulator. So, it is just defined by one differential equation. V is equal to square root of V d square plus V q square as discussed sometime previously in this lecture. So, the number of states are the 6 in fact. Uh, there are six differential equations corresponding to these six states. The other variables psi d, psi q, i d and i q, v d and v q are really not states. We have set d psi d by d t and d psi q by d t, d i d by d t and d i q by d t equal to 0, because of which we have got, re got rid of differential equations and redundancy of states. Okay? There are six algebraic equations of course and the inputs to the system are T m and E f t. Okay? E is of course, uh, the infinite bus voltage which also has to be given to you and the speed of the infinite or the frequency of the infinite bus also has to be given to you. Okay? Remember that the six others, other variables psi d, psi q, i d, i q, v d, v q which are no longer states can be obtained in terms of the states. The states are delta, omega, psi f, psi g, psi h and psi k by using these six linear algebraic equations. Linear simplifies our job okay? so, because the solution can be got in one shot without any numerical iterative procedure. So, you can directly write psi q and psi d, i d and i q and v d and v q in terms of delta, omega, omega in fact does not appear here because we have taken omega approximately equal to omega b, but 
delta appears in this E d and E q term and of course, psi f psi h psi g and psi k appear here. Okay. So, this is how we obtain all the equations a mixture of 6 differential equations and 6 algebraic equation. The algebraic equations allow us to get rid or, or rather a better word would be to get to write V d V q I d I q in terms of the states. Okay. So, in fact V d V q is required by the differential equation psi d psi q I d I q are required by the differential equation. These are in fact in terms of the states itself themselves psi f psi h psi g psi k delta and omega. Okay. So, it is a fairly trivial matter uh, to write psi d psi q i d i q v d v q in terms of the states and in some sense uh, you know eliminate them from the differential equations. So, before we close today let me just give you a flavor of uh, a simulation we will uh, will not we will not be able to explain all the aspects of the simulation today. What I will do is I will synchronize the generation generator right at time t is equal to 0, it will be a bumpless synchronization. Thereafter, I will increase the torque of the synchronous machine, I will load the synchronous machine and I will show you that the terminal voltage remains more or less constant in case you have got an AVR. Okay. And uh, after uh, 15 seconds, uh, we, of course, the step in uh, real power will be given at 5 seconds. After 15 seconds, we will give a step change in the reference value of the AVR. Okay. So, that is what we will simulate and uh, close this lecture thereafter. Okay. So, if I simulate this, I am simulating for 25 seconds with Euler method with a time step of 5 milliseconds. Okay. So, that is why it is taking a fairly large amount of time. Remember one more uh, problem which uh, is encountered uh, with Euler method is that one problem which is encountered with Euler method it is not a very numerically stable way of simulation. I have just used it for simplicity of uh, simulation. Okay. So, it is often said that Euler method is only taught it is never uh, used really in, uh, in practice. Okay. Uh, so, anyway uh, by making the time step very small and removing the stiffness or nonetheless I am able to use Euler method in this particular situation. Okay. I encourage you, you to try to use some other method. Now, let us plot how uh, E f d looks. Okay. Now, remember at 5 seconds I have increased the torque and at 15 seconds I have increased the reference value of the A v r okay, v ref. In both situations, you will notice that whenever there is a change in the loading of the machine at 5 seconds, the E f d changes from 1, which is the value under uh, no load conditions, it changes automatically to around 1.5. Okay? And if I change the V ref, that is the reference voltage of the synchronous machine, again E f d changes. Okay? Now, E f d is able to take on values as high as 7, because the limits are very high. You know. Uh, uh, excitation system of this kind is high ceilings. Okay. So, we are able to force the field to a very high value. Okay. That is of course, as I mentioned some time back, because the field winding is a very slow acting system and you really need to push it a lot in order to make it work faster. Okay. So, this is the way how field voltage changes. Remember, field voltage is no longer constant because it is being changed by the automatic voltage regulator. And if you look at V itself, okay, it's V gen. I have changed the ref. See, uh, your reference value initially was one per unit, near about one per unit. As I loaded the machine, the reference value went down slightly. Uh, rather, the terminal voltage magnitude went down slightly. Initially, it was one per unit. If I load the machine, it goes down. Now, the question is why does the voltage magnitude of the synchronous machine go down if it is regulated? Here, remember at 5 seconds, I have applied a load. Now, while if I applied a load, why should the terminal voltage magnitude change if it is being regulated by the AVR? That is one question which we need to ask ourselves. We will try to answer that question the next time. Of course, if I give a step change in the automatic voltage regulator at 10 seconds, of course, it was 10 not 15 seconds at 10 seconds, 
the terminal voltage of the machine goes up. So, it regulates it, okay. it changes the value according to the set point. Okay. So, it has gone to around 1.045 you know roughly. So, this is how uh, the AVR behaves, there are many many uh, interesting points which I need to discuss with you. Uh, there is not time uh, for that in this lecture. So, we will revisit this uh, point in the next uh, class, redo the simulation and uh, try to bring out some of the nice interesting points which come out of the simulation. So, for that we will meet again in the next class.